Great. Well, welcome back, everyone. Hope you had a really healthy lunch or a really unhealthy one if you want to see Jesus sooner. Uh, it's such a blessing to be here, and it's been so great to do this with team, just to have Max just jump up here and pray for me briefly before I got going. Uh, really a, a great thing, and, and to get to do this with my wife, uh, Jo, as well, uh, what a blessing that is. I have to clarify these days, my wife, Jo, because the last event that we did together, this is the beginning of August, and uh, I had already spoken, and Joe was about to speak, and we were both standing uh, next to this door that led out to on stage. I was talking to a pastor who was right in front of me, and Joe was maybe where that box is. You're talking maybe eight feet away or so. And uh, he looks at me halfway through the conversation, and he goes, oh, that's your daughter that's up next, right? And I felt like, like right in that moment, I entered a whole new season of life where that comment is like even in the realm of possibility. And that happens to my, happens to my dad often, and I give my dad such a hard time about it. And I haven't been able to bring myself to tell my dad that that happened yet, but uh, it did indeed happen. We're, uh, we're about halfway through now, halfway through our three days together. We've covered a lot of content, a lot of arguments, a lot of ideas, a lot of questions and answers, but none of that matters. All of that is completely irrelevant if we don't wind up in actual, real, relational conversations that allow us to have some of those conversations and ultimately focus in on the person of Jesus. So what I want to do in this session is zoom in on an area that God really zoomed in on in my life a number of years ago. I call it the art of conversation. Uh, I'm aiming for this session to be highly practical, some of it very simple, some of it will just be reminders, but I honestly believe that if we put these points into practice in our own lives, it will radically change the number of conversations we wind up in about Jesus, the enjoyment of those conversations, the fruitfulness that comes from those conversations. And I believe that can be the case for the people that we lead and the people that are under our care as well. So I hope for a lot of us, these are things that we'll pass on to our congregations and to other people that we're leading. A couple of reasons I want to focus in on conversation. One is because for almost all of us, we will be more influential in our conversation than in our preaching or upfront leading or speaking. Now, that might be a controversial statement to make with some of the pastors and speakers and other leaders that I've met in this room, but I think it's probably true. I think arguably you could even argue that it was true for Jesus. When you read through the Gospels, Jesus spent a lot of time just in conversation. He spent a lot of time talking with people, and it's an interesting question to ask. Was Jesus more influential through his preaching ministry or through his conversational ministry? There's not an easy answer to that question. Second reason I want to focus in on conversation. I want to spend some time on this because I think we tend to spend almost no time on this. If I ask you, are you more equipped in your biblical knowledge than you were five years ago? Hopefully most of the people in the room say yes. If you're someone who preaches or someone who leads Bible studies, are you better at that now than you were five years ago? Hopefully most of us say yes. If you're a parent Are you better? Have you learned some things through your failures along the way about parenting and you're a better parent now than you were five or ten years ago? Are you better in the context of your workplace now than you were five or ten years ago? Hopefully, again, we say yes. Then if I ask you, are you a better conversationalist than you were five years ago? I find that many people have a lot more difficulty answering that question in the affirmative than the other questions that I've raised. The problem, I think, is that we don't tend to take conversation seriously enough as an aspect of Christian discipleship. There's a scene in Pride and Prejudice. Uh, Joe made me watch it. (laughs) 16 times. (laughs) And Mr. Darcy says, I have not that talent which some possess of conversing easily with strangers. To which Elizabeth gives this great response. She says, I do not play the piano so well as I should wish to, but I've always supposed that to be my fault because I would not take the trouble of practicing. 
if someone's not a good conversationalist, we tend to not see that as a spiritual weakness. We tend to just think that's, well, that's just the way they are. That's just part of their personality. Sometimes we even see that as sort of an endearing trait. We don't see it as something to work hard to change. You know, if I preached a terrible sermon that would weigh on me, if I let an obscenity fly in a moment of anger, I'd be frustrated with myself. But if I had an uncreative, uninspiring, utterly boring conversation that literally put you to sleep, I usually wouldn't think twice about that. That just wouldn't be a big deal. I think that's a serious error in character formation and in Christian discipleship. You actually find a lot more advice on conversation in secular writing than you do in Christian writing. And if you read some of the secular sources, the main piece of advice centers around being prepared. Okay, here's one example of the sort of advice you find in this literature. Do research before any situation where you'll be talking to people. If you're going to a party, for example, ask the host about the guest's backgrounds and interests to uncover some interesting topics for small talk. Read the newspaper, watch television, surf the internet, and flip through books and magazines to come up with conversation starters and tidbits to discuss. Now, what should we make of this advice? It might initially seem a bit suspect, you know, we think there's something sort of prescriptive uh, and disingenuous about being prepared for conversation or investing beforehand in conversation. I want to at least call that into question. Okay, maybe that's a good worry. Maybe it's warranted at times, but I want to at least call it into question a bit. I wonder if as the church we've overreacted to the other extreme. In general, preparation, research, study, these are good things. Most of us have put in long and hard hours of research and study for all sorts of things. Exams we've prepared for, sermons that we've preached, sports that we play, sports that we follow, business projects, deciding on a college, buying a home, planning vacations. Why do we do so much research for these things? Why do we put so much preparation into them? Well, because we care about the end result and we care about the people who are affected by the end result. Well, then why shouldn't our most disciplined and extensive study be of people and for conversations with them? I realized a while back, I can tell you the batting average of every player on the New York Yankees to one-tenth of a percentage point. Okay, my dad, if you don't like the Yankees, you have to blame my dad. Uh, my dad was a big Yankees fan, and... I've been trying for some time now to get Joe interested in baseball. You'll probably be pleased to know, to no avail whatsoever. Uh, she just asked me, why do the players keep running around in circles wearing pajamas? <laughs> Never occurred to me. But, yeah, those uniforms do look a lot like pajamas. I can tell you the batting average of every player on the New York Yankees to one-tenth of a percent, and I can tell you all sorts of other interesting facts about their life and their career. And oftentimes, I can't remember the names of the siblings of some of my good friends. That's pretty pathetic. Why is it okay to do so much research and study and know so much about professional athletes or entertainment celebrities, but so little about people that we've actually met? Now, oddly, we don't think it's weird to plan or to prepare for an interaction for so with someone if it's a special occasion, if it's their birthday, or if we're going to take someone out on a date. Then we praise this sort of preparation. Why? Because it blesses the person. It values them. It honors them. It tells them that we care about them. Well, why should we restrict that to just the special occasions? Why should that be any different in just normal interaction, normal conversation. If I know I'm going to see someone tonight, why shouldn't I take some time to pray to God and say, God, do you have a specific question for me to ask this person tonight? Do you have a specific response for me to give to the question I know they're going to ask me because they always ask me that question when I see them? I don't see anything necessarily disingenuous or problematic about that. It just means I care enough to give a real question to someone, or to give them a real answer to a question that they ask me, rather than just the first thing that just jumps into my head. I wouldn't do that with my speaking. I wouldn't get up here and just start rambling about the first thing that jumped in my mind. 
That's not what I'm doing. (laughs) If I wouldn't do that with my speaking, why do I almost always just wing conversation? So I'd like to share a few pieces of advice, eight pieces of advice for investing more intentionally in conversation. Each one is very short, uh, but I've found each of these points to be personally, very practically and concretely, extremely significant in my own life. And actually, about halfway through and again at the end, we'll also even just do a, a couple little exercises where we'll break into groups of two or three, just in your, in your seats where you are, and talk some of this through as well. Okay, first point. I want to stress being multilingual, not just in terms of literal languages, fantastic if you have that gift, but in terms of being able to speak competently about the things that matter most to the people that you feel called to and that you care about. Now, one example of this in my life is that uh, my dad, like I said, he's a big New York Yankees fan. And about 13 years ago, I became a Christian about 17 years ago. And about 13 years ago, I had moved across the pond to England. And I was the first one to come to faith in my family that caused some significant tension. I think at the time, I wasn't mature enough to really see it from my parents' perspective, but there were some legitimate reasons that it was difficult for them. They sent one kid off to college. They got a different kid back in quite a literal sense. And I was saying, well, can't we just be happy about this? You know, I'm treating you better as my parents. I'm treating my brother better. Can't we just be happy? But from their perspective, they loved the kid they sent off to college. They got a different one back. They didn't care if he was better or worse. They just wanted the kid they sent off to college and that they loved. I think there was also a sort of implicit criticism. I didn't intend it, but I was now saying this is the most important thing in the universe, the person of Jesus and what he has done for us. And from my parents' perspective, and we didn't teach you that. So there was this implicit criticism that I didn't intend that I think they were feeling. And then also... For my dad, as an Italian-American father, but probably for many fathers, very central to his identity was this idea of being a father. He was the father figure. And now, all of a sudden, Vince has this invisible father figure, who is his primary father figure. And I think my dad felt some sort of infringement on his turf as well. I got back from college, so excited about my newfound faith. Hadn't had any of this training. (laughs) So zealous. You know, I got my first hands on my first apologetics book, and I just, I told everybody, we're meeting for Bible study and apologetic study every Sunday right here in the family room. My family, my parents, my brother, I mean, I did not give them an option. Uh, my, My three best friends as well, and, you know, just because of the strength of the friendships and the loyalty, they actually came And we worked through that. I hope some seeds were planted despite me. Uh, At the end of that study, I remember there's in the back of the book, there was a prayer you could pray if you wanted to give your life to Jesus, you know. So we got to that point and I said, I'm going to pray this prayer. And if anybody else wants to pray this prayer with me, feel free to join in. And as I go to bow my head, at the corner of my eye, I see my dad and my dad's going like this. (laughs) <laughs> and he's just he's saying, he's cueing everyone, just pray this stupid prayer, and maybe Vince will shut up about this Jesus thing. So they all prayed that prayer, and I don't think any of them became Christians at that point. Thankfully, most of them have uh, since. We, yeah, it actually is. It's a real, real testimony of God's faithfulness. You know, it was about a 13-year journey from when I became a Christian to when my dad did. And if you asked me in any one of those given years, if my dad was making progress relative to, say, the year before, I would have said, I don't see it. I don't see any progress. That's, that's how slow the trajectory was. But as God was just faithfully leading him in this really incremental way, deep roots were being laid as well. And I couldn't see it, but God was doing a glorious work. I hope that's an encouragement to some people in the room who were praying for family members and for friends for a long time and that we can't necessarily see that work having an impact, but oftentimes it is. So anyway, that's a bit of an aside, but that's where we were at in terms of the family dynamic. And I was trying to figure out, how do I reconnect with my dad? I'm thousands of miles away. I want him to know Jesus so bad. I want to connect relationally again, have that deep relationship, and even more so than we once had. And, and I sensed God prompting me 
to learn to speak the language of a New York Yankees fan. Not the most spiritual thing. And I started watching the games regularly. Within weeks, it's amazing how you can really manifest an affection for a team. I, within weeks, I was as much of a fan as he was. I knew all the stats. I knew all the batting averages. And it gave my dad and I something to talk about pretty much every day of the year. There's 162 games in the regular season and then the playoffs and then all the offseason trades. Every day of the year, we now had something to talk about. And it was just that starting point for something that my dad cared about. Maybe it wasn't the most meaningful thing in life, but it was a good thing. Sports are a good thing. And it was something where I could connect with him and build that relationship back. And I think if somebody now, oftentimes people do ask me this question. They say, hey, what was most significant, you know, in terms of the way you interacted with your dad that ultimately led to him coming to faith? And whenever someone asks that question, I don't think about how I got better at being able to explain the mechanics of the gospel and what it means that Jesus atoned for us on the cross. I don't think of the final conversation where we actually bowed our heads together and prayed together for him to give his life to Christ. I think about becoming a New York Yankees fan. You know, that was the most significant starting point to reestablish that relationship, which eventually opened the door to all those spiritual conversations. William Wilberforce, he's an excellent personal evangelist. And he would keep a list of people that he was talking to about faith or that he wanted to talk to about faith and ideas about how to engage meaningfully with each one of them. And it is said that he would spend an hour or more after dinner often just praying, thinking creatively about those relationships and jotting down notes, what he called launchers, ways of launching into meaningful spiritual conversations with those people. And you can find some of them in his diaries. And it'll just be little shorthand notes, give this book to so-and-so, invite to church, ask about their children, so-and-so and so-and-so, those sorts of little details. I think Wilberforce, he was following the example of God who understood that the best way to reach us was literally to come and speak our language. And so that's what I'm suggesting. What would it look like for us to learn to speak the languages of the specific people God is calling us to? And I wonder if I've been going through this, se this section, is there someone that comes to mind for you? Is there someone in your life that you're longing to share the faith with, but you're struggling to? Or maybe you're struggling to even establish the relationship that would make that possible. What are they interested in? What do they enjoy? What do they care about? And what is one thing that you could do to better learn their language? Something very specific, very concrete. Doesn't need to be overly spiritual. It could be that you start watching rugby. But is there one person that's on your heart? What is one thing they care about? And one way that you can connect with that language. Be multilingual. Second piece of advice, I would say be goal setters. Whenever Joe and I fly home, uh, to New Jersey, now from Atlanta, to see my family. We try to prayerfully come up with one goal for each member of my immediate family. Maybe uh, even for an extended family member, if we know we're going to see them. One conversational goal can be very simple. It could be, ask this cousin this specific question at some point. That simple. Ask my dad, how this has developed in his life. Oftentimes it's a question, or maybe it's one thing that I want to share with my brother about something that I've experienced in the context of the Christian faith that I just want to be able to share with him about and give him that glimpse into the Christian life. We find it has radically changed our interactions with family and with friends to set goals. Rather than just going home to New Jersey and just kicking our feet up and just saying, oh, it's vacation, it's time to rest. Yes, it is time to rest, but you'll go back home more refreshed if actually you've been intentionally involved in what God had for you in that time with family or with friends. So we try to go with one, we keep it simple, one specific goal, concrete, one specific question, and we share that with someone so that when we get back, that colleague or that friend asks us, hey, how did your brother respond to that question that you were planning on asking him? And then we have that accountability that's built into it as well. I think it's a good thing to set concrete goals. And a while back, I realized how many goals in my life I have set with respect to sports. 
You know, I just set goals one after another after another, concrete, serious, intense goals, and I was disciplined about trying to reach them. And how many times have I set concrete, specific goals with respect to my evangelism? Not nearly as many, and that doesn't make any sense. Sometimes I think we're wary of setting goals because it opens us up to the possibility of failure. I might set that goal and and fail to ask that question of my brother. But isn't this the amazing thing about the gospel? The whole beauty of the gospel is that we are free to fail. I'm free to set those goals because I don't have to worry about the fact that I'm not always going to reach them because I know that my identity and my eternity and my value is in no way caught up in whether or not I reach those goals. So I find because of the gospel, we should have this immense freedom to set those goals, not see that as legalistic, and yet go after them. And I think it radically changes the conversations that you might have. What evangelistic goals are you pursuing at the moment? That question may be answered differently by every one of us, but I hope by the end of our days together, everyone will be able to answer that question confidently. Third piece of advice for conversation, be question ready. Good questions are so powerful. I mean, a a good question, so often it pulls an answer out of me that I didn't even know was there, and even as I'm speaking it, I know it's absolutely right, precisely true. Jesus was in the habit of asking a lot of very good questions. Something like 157 of them are recorded in the New Testament. How are we at asking questions? As a society, I think we're generally pretty terrible. I don't observe a lot of difference here between Christians and non-Christians. And you can think about our most common questions. How are you doing? How's it going? All right. In, In England, all right can be both the question and the answer to that question? Is that, is that the case here as well? When I first arrived in England, I was so confused. People would be like, all right, and then they expect you to say, all right, and that was like a whole conversation. <laughs> Did you have a good summer? Did you have a good vacation? What's up? How's work? Did you see the game last night? Isn't the weather terrible? More of a British question. <laughs> not, not so much here. Easily 90% of our questions, I would say, stay on the surface level, and they can all be answered with either yes, no, or fine. The result is that I think the reason we often as the church find it so difficult to get from shooting the breeze to Jesus is because we spend such a high percentage of our time merely shooting the breeze, if we would spend more of our time in this middle ground, in just the meaningful areas, Jesus makes his way into those conversations much more naturally. Side note for parents in the room, my friend, who is the best question asker that I know, his parents had a rule when he was growing up. They were very hospitable, lots of people that came into their home and stayed with them and visited. And my friend always had to ask two questions of any person that visited. And then he was sort of off the hook. And he just got into the habit. He was just sort of trained to ask good questions of all sorts of different people, young and old and everywhere in between. And now you put him in any context and the idea of asking meaningful questions comes really naturally. Those sorts of examples all of a sudden have a lot more relevance for me as Joe and I look forward to our our first child. I personally have a list of questions that I like on my computer. They're questions that try to get beneath the surface and onto meaningful topics in ways that are not threatening. And then I try those questions out. Planes, taxis, haircuts, those are great. They've got no choice. You can try your question out. Some questions work great. Other questions fail royally. And then I go back maybe once a month or so, and I just read over that list. I edit it. Someone's asked me a great question. I put it on the list. I tried a question. didn't work very well. I take it off the list. And I just read through that list maybe once a month or so. And it just means that rolling around in my head are good, meaningful questions and not just, how was the weekend? Fine. My experience is that if you consistently ask good questions that get conversations onto meaningful topics, Jesus finds his way into those conversations very naturally. Here are some questions that I like. I'll just run through them very quickly, too fast to write them down, but if anyone's interested in seeing them as just a starting point for your own list, just come grab me afterwards. I'm happy to send them out. Some questions I like. What was the best part of your week? What was the worst part of your week? 
not just how, how was your week, fine. Right? You could just answer how was your week with fine. But what was the best part of your week? What was the worst part of your week? What's been on your mind most recently? When was the happiest time in your life and why? What are you good at? What are your dreams for the future? If money wasn't an issue and you could do anything you want, what would you do? What were you like as a child? Do you think you're different now? What is your best childhood memory? Whom in your family are you most alike? Whom are you most different from? In what ways? Whom are you closest to in your family? Are you close to your other family members? Who's your best friend and what's the best thing about them? How would your best friends describe you? Who has had the most significant influence in your life? How so? What would you change about yourself if you could change one thing? Did you grow up in a religious home? I ask that all the time. I find it's a less threatening question than just, are you a Christian? All of a sudden, somebody's on the back foot. Did you grow up in a religious home? It's a question about a person's history, a question about their culture, and all of a sudden, you're into the same exact conversation that you wanted to get into. If somebody says, yes, I'm a Christian, then I often follow up and say, did you take to the faith from a young age, or did you come kicking and screaming later? And that's just an invitation then for them to share their story, and pretty quickly, I know how they're doing and where they're at spiritually. Uh, what is the most frustrating thing about religion to you? Sometimes I enjoy asking more creative questions. If there was one law you could make, what would it be? If one law you could break, what would it be? Have you had experiences in your life that have made you think there might be a God? This is perhaps my favorite question. Have you had experiences in your life that have made you think there might be a God? And I find that if you ask that question and then you actually give someone the space to deal and process the question and respond, and you don't just jump in as soon as there's a bit of awkward silence and save them with a million different questions, it is unbelievable the things that people will say. And they'll tell you this story. They'll say, well, there was this one time when, and then they'll tell you this incredible story that has God's stamp of approval all over it. And now all of a sudden you're into this great conversation. You say, wait a minute, you're telling me you don't believe in God, but that happened to you? Tell me about that. Tell, tell me about how you hold both those things. What causes 80% of your stress? First time, first time that I asked that question, the person, without missing a beat, immediately responded, people like you asking me questions like that. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, what about the other 20%? And then we wound up in a great conversation. One more thought about questions. I was just thinking about this this morning. Somebody that does some training of our team named Judy Dabbler uh, speaks about this. Train yourself to ask connected questions. This is simple, but it's really, really significant. We tend to stay on the surface with all sorts of unrelated, independent, disconnected questions. So we say, what did you do this past weekend? Oh, I renovated the basement. Oh, interesting. What do you have going on next week? Oh, we got a few baseball games during the week for the kids. Oh, interesting. How was lunch? Oh, yeah, it was great. I really enjoyed the chicken. Right? They're, they're, they're questions that are independent of each other. They don't bear on one another. They're just separate related topics. Connected questions go deeper by responding to the information that someone has actually given you in their response to your first question. So you ask a question, someone gives you a response to that question, and you use the information they've given you to go deeper in the same direction. If we could train ourselves to do that, you won't believe how often you wind up in deep conversations. Because now, all of a sudden, this is a real conversation of mine from last week. What did you do this past weekend? I was renovating the basement. Why did you decide to renovate the basement? Okay, he told me he's renovating the basement. Makes it super easy on me. I don't have to think of some other creative question over here to change topics. He told me what to ask about. He said, I renovated the basement. I said, oh, why do you renovate the basement? To stay on the same topic. All of a sudden, oh, my wife's sister, she's really not doing well. My wife thinks she should move in with us. Oh, interesting. So then, stay there. Stay on that topic. Was that an easy decision for you guys to make, for your wife's sister to move in with you? Or was that a, a difficult decision? Whoosh. <laughs> right? And it all comes out, right? The tension that's going on relationally. And now, all of a sudden, we're into a whole conversation about relational tension, about family, about what it could look like to reconcile in the context of that relationship, about how reconciliation can happen in the context of real forgiveness and what confession is and what it might look like to go to one's spouse and say, hey, these are the feelings I've been having towards this and I haven't expressed them and will you forgive me about that? Now we're 
because of two additional questions on the same topic, we're right into a gospel conversation. But so often, we're just jumping on the surface from one topic to another. Most people never get asked a fourth or fifth question on the same topic. And usually, by the time you get to the third or definitely by the fourth, you are right to the heart of what is going on in a person's life at the deepest level. Fourth piece of advice, don't only be question ready, but also be response ready. I think our responses to common questions are often just as bad as the common questions themselves. So here are some of the most common responses to the common questions. Okay, all right, not bad, pretty good, can't complain, getting by, hanging in there, same all, nothing, not much, fine, eh? (laughs) Those are some of our most common responses to the most common questions that were asked. And it would be hard to think of any that were more boring or any less contentful. What are the questions that you get asked most often? How was your weekend? Not bad, thanks. How was your weekend? Really good, actually. You know, on Saturday, we were just doing some things around the house. We went to the movies. Sunday, uh, we went to church. That's always a highlight for us. Do you ever go to church? No, never. No, we never used to either, but a couple years ago, someone invited us along. We've actually found just an incredible community there. It's been a really positive experience for us. We'd love to have you join us sometime. That's not that weird. (laughs) In fact, that's just a more honest answer. If you have gone to a gospel-centered church on Sunday and you have worshipped and encountered the living God, then if somebody asks you, how was your weekend on Monday, and you say, not bad, thanks, you have lied to them. That is not even an honest answer. And we get that question every single week. If you are a church-going Christian, the question, how was your weekend, is an utter gift, and we pass it on, we pass it up week after week after week. Can we be more intentional about that? There are many different ways to answer questions like, how was your weekend? What do you do? How often do we get that question? How was that conference you went to last week? A lot of us are going to get that question in the next few days. And some of the answers are going to lead to meaningful conversations. Some of them are not. Everyday questions, an amazing opportunity that we pass up all the time. So next five minutes or so, here's what I want to do. Just turn where you are into twos or threes and see if each person can identify one question that you get every week that you tend to respond to uncreatively and without content. And then, together as a two or three, just brainstorm together, think creatively together, how could I respond to that question in a more robust way, in a richer way, in a way that's more likely to lead to a good conversation? We'll take five, seven minutes to do that, and then we'll jump back in. Go for it.
Okay, just one minute, one minute. All right, here we go. Great, I hope that was a profitable time. It's what I like to see. Excellent to see the energy around that. I hope that was useful. Uh, you know, I, I used to think it was remarkable how, how quick Jesus was on his feet. I mean, of course I still do. You know, Jesus, he's omniscient. He can be as quick on his feet as he, as he wants to be. But to a certain extent, I found this sort of discouraging. You know, like just the amazing lines that he would come out with. You know, just, just why do you call me good? You who are without sin, throw the first stone. Render to Caesar what is Caesar's, but to God what is God's. You know, the sort of lines I think about in the car about three hours later on the way home. <laughs> and, and I sort of was discouraged by that. And now I'm still just as amazed at Jesus' conversational gifts. But the more I think about it and the more I read those passages in the Bible, I wonder, were they just instances of Jesus being incredibly quick on his feet? Or were they perhaps also instances of Jesus having spent an hour or more after dinner or early in the morning with his father, thinking about the day ahead, thinking about the sorts of questions that he was likely to receive, the people he was likely to interact with, the ways that Pharisees might likely try to trap him? Why wouldn't Jesus been, have been talking with his father about that and doing exactly what Wilberforce was doing when Wilberforce talks about those launchers? And maybe it was way before those people decided to say those specific lines that Jesus knew exactly how he was going to respond because he had been disciplined in loving those people enough to be prayerful about them and the interactions that he would have with them way before they actually happened. A fifth point, be testimony ready. Some of the deepest and most meaningful conversations happen when we can relate to what other people are saying. I think so much evangelism is about understanding someone else's story, understanding your own story, and finding Christ at the intersection of those two stories. And I've been more and more convinced over the years that one of the reasons we often find evangelism so difficult is actually because we don't know our own stories that well. At some point, perhaps after we became a Christian or when we got to a certain adult age, someone told us to write our testimony right? This two to three minute thing along the life before Christ, encounter with Christ, life after Christ model. And we wrote that two to three minute testimony along what, whichever theme was most relevant to us at the time. And then every time that someone's asked us to share our spiritual story or our testimony, we've given that same two to three minutes feel. Now, I'm so thankful that I have that three minute response. And I use it all the time. And I'm so grateful for the person who initially asked me to sit down and reflect on that and write it. But the reality is that every one of us and everyone in our care has innumerable, not just testimony, but testimonies of the way that God has worked. God has worked through all sorts of different themes in our life. And if we can understand our stories across many different themes, then whoever we're talking with and whatever it is that they're going through, we'll be able to connect with that. We'll be able to say, I understand how God has been at work in that theme in my own life. And so I can find the points of intersection between your life and my life and see if we can expose who Jesus is at that point of intersection. I mean, maybe just throw out a, 
a few ideas. What are some themes, general themes, along which it would be helpful to be able to understand and express our story? Suffering, thank you. Rejection, Rejection. great. What was that next one? Provision, Provision. excellent. Identity. Identity, absolutely. Forgiveness, yes. Praise. Yeah. Anyone here any that are not, that's not relevant to them and their life? Anybody in the room think, "Oh yeah, you know, about two of those are relevant to me, but actually no, God hasn't done any work in my life with respect to those other themes." No, probably every one of us in the room could say, "Yep, I I could if I was reflective about it and thoughtful about it, I could share something about who God is and the way he's interacted with me along every one of those themes. Here's some themes that just came to me off the top of my head that I jotted down. Some of them overlapped. Forgiveness, family, suffering, intellect, relationships, guilt, death, fear, dreams, purpose, loneliness, freedom, pride, worry and anxiety, shame, frustrations with the church, decisions about the future, image, identity. Again, surely nine out of ten for every one of us in the room, of those themes is relevant to the work that God has done and that he is continuing to do in our lives. So I like to actually sit down, and one of the exercises that I do from time to time is write out my testimony along different themes and just spend a quiet time just thinking with God, okay, along the theme of pride, how is it that you have begun your work in my life and you're continuing that work? And wouldn't it be great, I mean, if I could actually express my testimony along all of those different themes that we have just mentioned, then whoever I'm talking to and whatever they're dealing with, I can legitimately find a point of connection between my story and their story and find Christ at the intersection of that. The other fantastic thing about doing this is it just brings me to a place of greater praise and worship of God because it's great that God did whatever it is that he did in that two to three minute testimony that I first came up with, but he's done so much more in my life. And as I write out these additional testimonies along different themes, I just realize that God's work in my life is so much more rich and robust, and it goes so much further back in my life than I ever realized, and it leads me to greater worship and praise of him. Sixth piece of advice is to be prayer ready. I'll be very short on this one, but the Bible tells us that our prayers are powerful and effective. How amazing is that? Can we just take a moment to just appreciate how amazing that is, that I am here in Australia, and I can have a concrete, real, tangible impact on my best friend in New Jersey who's going through that really tough time in his life by praying here 14 time zones away. That is utterly unbelievable. I mean, prayer is literally a superpower. It's action at a distance. Unbelievable. And so really just one question for us on this point. How is it that we make sure that our prayer for those who are not yet Christians is consistent and disciplined and not just if we happen to remember? Right? If we believe what the Bible says about prayer, there are many different ways you can answer that question. You know, someone told me earlier they have an app on their phone that goes off, gives them an alarm, and it reminds them to pray. A million different ways you can do that, but every one of us in the room and every one of the people under our care should be encouraged to have some way to make sure that that prayer for not yet believers is consistent and is disciplined. It's not just if we happen to remember. Seventh point I want to mention. Be good stewards of conversations. If I handed you a $100 bill, I'm also not going to do it, just like Sam didn't do it. (laughs) If Sam did, I would, so you can blame him. But if I handed you a $100 bill right now, I find it very unlikely that by the time you walk out of the room, you would have just left it somewhere. I would just, I'd just find it on the floor or just, you know, in the crevice of your seat or something like that. Well, when you get into a deep, meaningful conversation with someone, And they have given you the gift of sharing something vulnerable about who they are or what they have been through. How much is that worth to you? How often does someone give us something which is so much more valuable than $100? And we have that conversation in this room, and by the time 
we've left the door, we've, we've tossed it in the garbage, right? We no longer have that bill. We no longer have that valuable thing that that person entrusted to us. Now, I don't necessarily trust myself to remember all of the valuable things that people share with me. So I actually devote Microsoft files to friends and people in my life. Now, some people think that's creepy. Uh, I don't think it is. The test is, would the person who the file is about be encouraged if they saw it? So before we got married, I had a file on Joe. Because <laughs> she was telling me valuable things, and I didn't want that to just fall out of my head. I wanted to be able to follow up on that. I wanted to be able to pray about that. I wanted to like learn about her in a deepening sort of way and not just be losing stuff while I was gaining stuff. <laughs> but I gave, her, I gave her that file as a gift before we got engaged, and she was encouraged by it. So, that's the, so, that's, so, I, so there's two keys here. One... Only write something down that you could share with the person and they would be encouraged and feel honored and valued. Two, confidentiality, utterly important. So if I do that, it's only in the context of a password-protected file that that only I can access. But I don't trust that I'm just going to be able to remember everything. So I want to take care with those great gifts that people have given me. And if this is somebody that I know I'm going to see about four times a year, I want to write those things down so I can remember to pray for them. And then when it comes up, oh, yeah, I'm going to see that person in a couple of days. Oh, let me go back to that. Oh, right, this is what was going on in their life. Oh, this was the thing that you know I said that I would pray for. And, so, and then I can actually pick that conversation up where it ended rather than you know getting in that awkward situation where you're like, oh, man, I know I'm supposed to know something about what's going on in their life, and I, I can't remember it, and so I can't ask about it because I'm already supposed to know it. And it's just really significant if we can be trustworthy with what people have given us in terms of prayer and in terms of the way we continue to deepen the relationship because we don't just forget or throw in the garbage on the way out the door the different valuable gifts that people give to us in conversation. Be organized enough. Care about people enough. Somebody said good administration is good pastoral care. I think that's really true. I have one more encouragement I want to share. But first, just let me say, one of the reasons I get, some of this is simple. But one of the reasons I get so excited about sharing it is that I have seen communities of Christians and churches transformed in terms of their conversation and then in terms of their evangelism and then in terms of their health and their growth. Many of you in the room are leaders. Don't think of this just for yourself. Think, how, how can I pass this on? How can I create a culture in my community, in my church, where we are going to be great conversationalists? Why? Because Jesus was the greatest conversationalist of all time, and therefore this is a serious aspect of Christian discipleship. And many people think, oh, I don't know if I can do evangelism. I, I, I find that pretty intimidating. Sometimes it's just because the word comes with a lot of baggage. It's not true of it. Well, start out talking about conversation. Can you do meaningful conversation? Can you have a list of questions on your computer that you read over once in a while so you're not just asking how was your weekend, but you're asking a deep and meaningful question? Can you just get into meaningful conversations more regularly? If you get your church or your community doing that with consistency and disciplined about it and excited about it because it's an aspect of Christian discipleship, Jesus will make his way into those conversations all the time, and more and more people will wind up turning to Jesus and giving their life to them. Is your church great at conversation? All right, a last encouragement. Be invitational with the gospel. Invite people to Jesus. That might seem really simple, but no matter how great a party you're throwing, and no matter how much you tell people how great your party is going to be, and no matter how much you tell them how excited you are, about the party, if you don't actually extend to them an invitation, not that many people are going to show up. And we don't want people to just know about the incredible party, the incredible banquet that God is throwing. We want them to actually be there with us. We want them to actually be there rejoicing with us. I always remember one student named Natasha. She journeyed with us for a few days on a university mission 
a week-long series of evangelistic events that we do. She didn't seem to have any very specific obstacle or objection she needed to work through. She gave her life to Christ about halfway through the week. And I remember one of our staff said to her, hey, why didn't you become a Christian sooner? She took the question very seriously, processed it, kind of leaned back, thought about it. And she said, I think I just needed an invitation. And I can't tell you how many times I've heard that since. I think I just needed an invitation. How many people that we walk by every single day just need an invitation? Are we willing to find out? Are there people in my life, I find this an incredibly challenging question, are there people in my life whom I love dearly, whom I've told how great God is, I've told them about my testimony. Maybe I've even answered some of their questions and their objections about faith. But if you ask me, have I actually extended an invitation to them to trust the person of Jesus? The answer is no. Have I actually extended that invitation? Have I just said to them, hey, w would you be interested in putting your trust in Jesus? Is there anything that's keeping you from putting your trust in Jesus? Would you want to join me in living the Christian life? Just that simple invitation is often so powerful. Why do we so often not make the invitation? After all, an invitation is supposed to be a gift. It's supposed to be a gift to someone, even if for some reason they think, I can't take that gift right now. If I give you an invitation to my wedding, I've given you a gift. I've honored you. Even if you RSVP no, and for some reason think you can't make it, I've still given you a gift can we as a church become people who are so comfortable giving invitations because we're giving them in a way that honors people and respects them and makes them feel valuable because that's what an invitation is supposed to do, even if they're not ready to accept that invitation at that time? Why do we so often not make the invitation, even though invitations are supposed to be gifts? I think it's because sometimes I get fooled into thinking that God is far from people in my life. I assume they're not ready to respond. They don't know enough. Surely they have more questions and more objections. They haven't had enough time to consider it. They, they haven't had enough experience of God. Of course they're not ready to respond. There's no way. I assume that God is far from them. And I think at the root of this is partly that I'm sometimes deceived into thinking that evangelism is about me rather than God. Right? Evangelism is something that I do. I do it for God. You know, he's not really involved. And if that's the case, then yes, it would be incredibly arrogant for me to think that I, Vince, could show up into a conversation with a hardened skeptic and that I, through my conversation over the course of the next hour, could do so much to persuade that person's mind and their heart to make the most significant life decision that they could ever make. That would be incredibly arrogant. But here's the thing. The reality of this situation is so very different. What does the Bible say? The Bible says that God is not far from each one of us. Acts 17, 27. God is not far from any person. The Bible says that the true light, which gives light to everyone, has come into the world. John 1, 9. And actually what the Bible claims is even stronger. Not only is God not far from every person, but in Romans 1, 19 to 20, Paul talking about not yet believers. This is what he has to say. Hear this very carefully. For what is known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. I don't know if you've ever noticed it, but it's an incredibly strong statement. It's not saying people just know something about God, but they know his divine nature. It says it is plain to people that God has shown it to them. And then in case there's any doubt, it uses an even more emphatic word to say that God's nature has been clearly perceived. Paul teaches us something that I think is extremely exciting. Every person you meet Every person in your life, every person that you ever walk by on the street, they already know God somewhere deep down. 
This is not to minimize legitimate questions or legitimate objections or legitimate doubts. Those things are real. But if what God tells us in the scriptures is true, people know God. It says in the verse before that that truth is suppressed, but it's there. And all we're doing is trying to participate and just come alongside as some of those obstacles might be removed to the left or the right so that that truth can rise to the surface. But it's already there. Do we believe that? I think that's one of the most important questions for the church. Do you believe that about your friends and your family? Do you believe that about the people you meet every day? Do you believe that every time you step into a conversation, God has already been revealing himself clearly and plainly? He's been showing himself. I think the crisis of the church in large part is that people have stopped believing that. And therefore, they've stopped believing in the power of of the gospel, and therefore they have stopped making invitations to people to actually join us in the Christian life. Here's the thing. If you believe God when he says that everyone knows him somewhere deep down, then all of a sudden you start to believe that someone's trust in Jesus could be right around the corner in any conversation that you wind up in could always be right there, one question away, one conversation away. And I think that's when things start to get incredibly exciting. Last year, I spoke in a church in Ohio, and I spoke in the morning at the service, and then there was a kind of special apologetics evangelistic evening on the Sunday night. And after I was done speaking, two people approached me. One had a question about suicide, another one about transgender, long conversations with both of them. By the time I'm done, It's about an hour, hour and 15 minutes after I'm finished. And there's one guy left in the room, far corner, over there, arms crossed, looked like a real curmudgeon. (laughs) And I I walked up to him and I said, thanks so much for waiting. Uh, Is there anything I can help you with? And he said, I'm just trying to give my life to Christ. (laughs) (laughs) And I almost, I almost said, what? But he was so clear in what he said. Turns out he had come to the service that morning. First time back in a church in many years. Life had completely collapsed. Knew for the first time that he was a sinner in need of a savior. Felt convicted through the message and the worship. Comes forward to the front at the end of the service to find someone to give his life to. Can't find anyone. All the leadership have spread. Everybody's gone to their next task. Get ready for the next service. Comes back. Thank God there was a Sunday night event. He comes back on the Sunday night, sits through it, waits in the corner by himself. Nobody says hello for over an hour for me to walk up to him. And he says, I just want to give my life to Christ. And then he says this. This is the best part. He says, and to be honest, I'd kind of like to do this with a normal person. (laughs) I guess he meant someone who wasn't ministering in some way he goes but you're still here and you know when I debriefed with the leadership at that church it was convicting you know because here's the thing he didn't even want to give his life to Christ with me he wanted to do it with a normal person if anyone not just on the leadership but if anyone in that church had just gone up to him and said hey how's it going he would have said I just want to give my life to Christ but no one was thinking Everyone was thinking, this has to be this long process all the time. Sometimes it is, but nobody was thinking, God is near. He's not far. Nobody was thinking Romans 1. This guy, or everybody does. So this guy in the corner, he knows God. It might be suppressed, but he knows God. And so it could be right then and right there that God is looking to bring someone to himself. Sometimes it's as simple as an invitation. I have another student who, he came to Christ because a friend invited him to church He went to church. The friend overslept, never made it. The student overheard the music, kind of peeked his head in the back, found a chair back here in the corner, heard a message from John 15. I no longer call you servants, but friends. Pierced to the heart, goes forward, gives his life to Christ. Can you imagine? The guy who invited him to church calls later in the day to ask for forgiveness for completely standing him up, and the guy's already become a Christian. (laughs) Point is, God will use our invitations. God will use what we have. Even if sometimes all we have is inviting someone to church and oversleeping, God will use it if we're trusting him with our invitations. 
final encouragement. A while back, a young man named Isaac, he showed up at church. And uh, after the message, he came up. He asked a really difficult question about hell. He identified himself uh, as having grown up in a Christian home, but now as a non-Christian. Asked this question about hell. A colleague of mine and myself, we gave the best answer that we could. I could see in his eyes as I was talking that something was shifting and that he was responding positively. Uh, but then he said, thank you very much, and he, and he just sort of walked away and towards the back of the church. Somebody else came to talk to us, and as I'm starting the conversation with someone else, I, just, I could feel it in my gut, you know, that God had more work to do in that conversation. And I thought, you know what, I took his question seriously, but I didn't extend that invitation. And um, halfway through this other conversation, and I had to say, Ex- could you excuse me a second? I'll be back in just a bit. And so I, I chased after this guy out the back of church into this dark alley. <laughs> and he was a little freaked out. But I said, I said I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry uh, to scare you like that. Um, and, and if I'm wrong, you know, that's fine as well. But I just sense in our conversation that maybe, you know, more was going on in your heart than, than was expressed. And if there's anything that you, you know, want to say, I'd really like to recommit my life to Jesus tonight. Just halfway through that, I never got to the point of saying, I'd love to come alongside you and and help you to say anything you want to say to God. And it just came out of his mouth. And I was just so convicted because I thought it was literally on the on the on the tip of his tongue. He was he was looking for an opportunity to say that, and I almost just didn't ask. And so my encouragement would be in your own lives and in the lives of the people that you lead, take those promptings from the Holy Spirit. I call them Holy Spirit U turns. When you're in a conversation and then you go to walk away and you know it right down here in the gut, you know God had more work to do that. Make that turn. Head back into that conversation. Find an awkward transition back into that conversation. God will honor that. God will use that. Make those Holy Spirit U-turns. And I think one of the most exciting things about that is that I can remember years ago, situations like that, having the exact same feeling in my stomach at the end of a conversation. But years ago, the same biological feeling was the feeling of nerves and anxiety because I was uh, afraid to try to enter back into that conversation. And one of the cool things standing there as I watched Isaac walking out of the, out of the church was that I had the same exact feeling in my gut, but it was the feeling of excitement and expectation. Because every time you say yes to that Holy Spirit U-turn and you work your way back into that conversation and God honors that, you build up more and more evidence of God's faithfulness in pursuing people through conversation and leading people to Him. So every time you make that turn, you get that evidence. Let me just end by returning to a question that uh, I've already asked. Is there someone in your life that you love dearly? who knows you're a Christian, you've shared your story with them, you've answered some of their objections perhaps, but if you're honest, you've never actually extended that simple invitation to them to follow Jesus in a way that's not threatening, in a way that is extended as a gift, in a way that honors them and gives them a sense of what it would be like to say yes to that gift even if they're not ready right now. What would make these three days successful that we're spending together? Lots of different things. But one of those things would be if each of us had someone in mind that maybe God's putting on our heart right now, somebody that we've never extended that invitation to. I really believe evangelism is a team sport, and I love doing it in the context of community. The amazing thing is that if each one of us in this room were to go off in the next week and extend a simple invitation, even to people who we think, oh, there's no way they'll say yes, If we were to extend those simple invitations, there'd be quite a number of people who would say yes. The kingdom of God, the community of believers would be bigger a week from now because as a group we decided we're going to extend some of those invitations and see how the Spirit works through them. Uh, That would be an encouragement that I would have for us as a group. Maybe I'll mention it again at the end of our time together tomorrow. But for now, is there just somebody that God's beginning to stir in your heart. It'd be so great if there was a single person or a couple of people that these three days were about in your life, that God was saying there's a direct connection between what I'm doing in your heart and in your mind here and what I want to do in that person's life. I think if we ask him for it, God will put those people on our hearts, and if we extend those invitations, I think we'll see people come to know Jesus, and I'd be really excited about that. I'm sure you would as well. Let me pray for us.
Lord, I'm excited speaking about what you can do, what you have done, what you will do. Thank you that you've revealed yourself to people. Thank you that people know you. Thank you that the person in my life who I think is absolutely furthest from you, that has rejected you in the fullest way, who could never possibly turn around and come to know you, thank you that that is the person that you are close to. That is a person that already knows you because you've revealed yourself. Thank you for that grace. And I pray that you would raise the faith in my heart and in this room to truly believe, not just to say it, not just to know it intellectually, but to trust you that you can reach even the person who seems furthest from you. And God, most of all, I really do pray, would you put people on our hearts right now, over the next day, before the end of tomorrow, would you put specific people on our hearts that you would have us extend that invitation to? And God, would we see people say yes to it? And would we rejoice with you and with each other? In Jesus' name, amen.